This week, OneWeb and Starlink collaborate. China gets in the game. Google wins the contract. Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin take another hit. Will society forever be changed by the future of space internet? I'm on the road. All this and more. Let's go. On last week's episode, we covered a story about a near collision between a OneWeb satellite and a Starlink satellite. Now, OneWeb publicly claimed that Starlink refused to communicate with them and refused to do any maneuvering in order to avoid a collision. Now, both were called before the FCC, and the outcome of that were a bit murky. However, it was very clear that the FCC sided with Starlink. Not only did they say that Starlink did communicate with OneWeb, but there really wasn't any risk of collision at all. They did, however, take the time to reiterate that they need these companies to collaborate and they expect them to do all that they can do to avoid any such collisions in the future. This week, we got to see that in action, and it looks like they collaborated and had a successful avoidance maneuver. On May 11th, Paul M. Suter reports, Starlink and OneWeb have the first avoidance maneuver with each other's constellations. Near misses are unavoidable, as both companies found out on March 30th when they received several red alerts from the U.S. Space Force 18th Space Control Squadron warning of a possible collision. The red alert came just five days after OneWeb launched 36 satellites from Russia. While the OneWeb constellation orbits at a higher altitude than Starlink, it must pass through those orbits to get to their operational location. The Space Force alert noted that the two satellites would pass within 190 feet of each other, which isn't a lot when both spacecrafts are flying at thousands of miles per hour. The probability of the collision was calculated to be 1.3%. SpaceX claims it has an AI-powered automated collision avoidance system on board its spacecraft, but the company strangely shut it down and allowed OneWeb to alter the course of the satellite instead. SpaceX did not provide public commentary on the event. The Near Miss has renewed calls for more transparency, accountability, and coordination of orbital activities. There is no law or authority that forces companies or agencies to move their satellites in case of a potential collision. Just a desire not to wreck perfectly good hardware and contribute to the spread of precious space junk. Still, no satellites were harmed in the event, which is a good thing. This event was a good example of how satellite operators can be responsible given the constraints of global best practices, says Diana McKissick, the head of the Space Force 18th Space Control Squadron's data sharing and spaceflight safety wing. They shared their data with each other. They got in contact with each other. And I think in absence of any global regulation, that's the art of the possible. Speaking of collaboration, Amazon takes another L as Google collaborates and wins a contract with Starlink and SpaceX to host their cloud services. But they go a step further. They're going to be able to directly connect to their data centers from the satellites. That's right, Google's actually going to host ground stations for them directly in their data centers to create a secure connection from satellite directly into Google's infrastructure. That means a secure connection for enterprise, and man, I gotta say, it's pretty amazing what that could bring. CNBC reports Google wins cloud deal from Elon Musk SpaceX for Starlink internet connectivity. Google announced on Thursday its cloud unit has won a deal to supply computing and network resources to SpaceX, Elon Musk privately held space development company, to help deliver internet services through its Starlink satellites. SpaceX will install ground stations at Google data centers that connect to SpaceX Starlink satellites, with an eye towards providing fast internet service to enterprises in the second half of this year. The deal represents a victory for Google as it works to take market share from Amazon and Microsoft in the fast-growing cloud computing market. It's also an unusual type of deal for Google, or any other cloud provider, as it relies heavily on Google's internal network that connects data centers rather than simply outsourcing functions like computing power or data storage to these data centers. This is one of a kind. I don't believe something like this has ever been done before, said Bikash Kohli, Google's head of global networking. The real potential of this technology becomes very obvious. The power of combining cloud with the universal security connectivity, it's a very powerful combination. They chose us because of the quality of our network and the distribution and reach of our network, says Thomas Curran, CEO of Google Cloud Group. The deal could last seven years according to a person who declined to be named discussing confidential terms. Starlink service might be valuable for customers living in places with limited internet access, as well as businesses and government organizations running projects in remote areas, Curran says. He anticipates that having Starlink draw on Google's cloud network will lead organizations to deploy applications inside Google's cloud to take advantage of high speeds. 
And if that's not bad enough, Bezos took another right hook from the US government, losing the lunar landing missions to SpaceX. As reported by the Washington Post, Blue Origin's loss to SpaceX on a lunar lander contract may get Congress to do something it hadn't done before, give NASA extra money. For the past couple of years, top NASA officials had lobbied Congress to give the space agency enough money so that it could land the next astronauts on the moon by 2024. For the past couple of years, top NASA officials have lobbied Congress to give the space agency enough money so that it could land the next astronauts on the moon by 2024. To meet that goal, NASA requested $3.3 billion for this year to develop a spacecraft capable of ferrying the first humans to the lunar surface since the Apollo era. Instead, despite an intense lobbying campaign led by former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein, Congress appropriated $850 million, a sizable amount but only a fraction of what NASA said it needed. Now it seems Jeff Bezos may be having more luck pulling money out of Congress for NASA's moon mission than the space agency itself has had. With the limited funding, NASA said it could afford to pay for only a single company to build a lunar lander, and last month it was awarded to Elon Musk SpaceX. As a result, Bezos' space venture, Blue Origin, lost out after bidding $6 billion, or twice what SpaceX had said it would charge. Along with Dianetics, the defense contractor that also lost out on the contract, Blue Origin protested NASA's decision, saying the space agency executed a flawed acquisition. It also took to Capitol Hill, lobbying its allies in Congress to force NASA to come up with additional money and make a second award. On Wednesday, Senator Maria Cantwell of Washington State, where Blue Origin is headquartered, came through, introducing legislation that calls for NASA to do just that. The legislation, which passed as an amendment to another bill, would authorize but not appropriate any additional $10 billion to the Artemis program through fiscal 2026. It also calls for NASA to pick a second winner for the contract. We're pleased that the Senate Commerce Committee recognized the importance of competition in NASA's Human Landing System program, Blue Origin said in a statement. Continued competition will safeguard America's space industry base and get America back to the moon as quickly as possible. Almost as soon as the contract was awarded to SpaceX, Cantwell, the chair of Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, said she was concerned about having only a single provider for the program. During Bill Nielsen's confirmation hearing to become NASA's administrator last month, she pressed Nelson to commit to rapidly providing Congress with a plan for assuring the kind of resiliency out of the human lander program. She added, I have to say, I was surprised last week about the human landing system development contract. Her legislation would still need to pass the full Senate and the House, and the money would still need to be approved by the appropriator. But it represents an important first step and shows Bezos' influence in Washington. Returning to the moon is a lifelong dream of his. Bezos has called watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon a seminal moment for him. Blue Origin first pitched NASA on a lunar lander in 2017, long before NASA opened an official competition for the program. Losing out on the contract was a huge blow for Bezos and Blue Origin, which vowed to fight back. Now I'm not saying Bezos can't boss his way in, however sipping martinis on a yacht while Elon is busy grinding and racking up W's just doesn't seem like a good look. Now it's not all unicorns and rainbows for Elon and Starlink. The Chinese government just announced they've got a mission of their own. Reported by South China Morning's Post, China's new bid to take on Elon Musk Starlink, a state-owned satellite enterprise. In late April, a day before SpaceX launched its 10th batch of satellites this year, Chinese Vice Premier Han Zhang attended a ceremony in Zaigan, a mega city that is about two hours drive south of Beijing, celebrating the creation of a new state-owned enterprise set up to operate China's answers to Starlink. Known as China's Satellite Network Group, the young company is tasked with launching low-orbit LEO satellites into space, beaming internet services to anywhere on the planet. The creation of Chinese Satellite Network Group represents Beijing's latest push into its ambitious bid to provide worldwide internet connectivity with satellites circling the globe, a technology currently dominated by U.S. players such as SpaceX. Before the birth of Chinese Satellite Network Group, the country's two major state-run aerospace companies, China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation CASC, and China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporations CASIC, already had their own satellite internet programs. CASIC, under its Hongan and Zaigan programs, is planning to launch 156 and 80 satellites respectively to achieve global coverage while CACS announced plans in 2016 to set up more than 300 satellites under its Hongan project. 
While Chinese satellite group has yet to launch a single satellite, Chinese submitted filings to the UN's International Telecommunications Union, or the ITU, last September, signaling the country's intent to construct two LEO constellations totaling 12,992 satellites. That number is still a fraction of the 42,000 planned satellites that are Starlink registered with the ITU. And an analyst says these findings are merely a preliminary requirement that does not always translate to actual launches. Sure, the Chinese have rockets and they've shown they don't give a fuck about jugging up space, but can they compete with Elon? Well, guess what? He may not need to compete because does he really need China? Reported by Reuters, Starlink satellite internet service gets 500,000 pre-orders, Musk says. SpaceX has received more than 500,000 pre-orders for its SpaceX satellite internet service anticipates no technical problems meeting the demand, founder Elon Musk said on Tuesday. Only limitation is high density of users in urban areas, Musk tweeted. More of a challenge when we get into several million user range, Musk said. SpaceX has not set a date for Starlink service launch, but commercial service would not likely be offered in 2020 as it had previously planned. The company plans to eventually deploy 12,000 satellites in total and has said that Starlink Constellation will cost roughly $10 billion. The idea of increased safety, connection, data uploads from the field are nothing less than game-changing for me and certainly for the many rural bungalows that dot the U.S. Recently, three space nerds hashed this very subject out on GeekWire. Imagine a world where high-speed internet blankets every corner of the globe, transforming the way people access healthcare, education, and entertainment. That's the promise of up-and-coming satellite broadband, an ambitious and controversial plan to connect far reaches of the planet. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and SpaceX founder Elon Musk are attacking the opportunity with vigor and billions of dollars, hoping they can solve an elusive problem of getting internet connectivity to the masses no matter where they live. But the concept is not new. In fact, some of the original seeds were planted in the Pacific Northwest decades ago when billionaires Bill Gates, Craig McCow, Boeing and others bankrolled the ill-fated Teledisc, which also promised a constellation of low-orbit satellites. We talked to the experts in the field to discuss the technical challenge of the satellite broadband, the potential of society benefits, and who will regulate space. Our guests on the show include Rob Meyerson, the former president of Blue Origin, the space company started by Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. He's also a partner with C5 Capital, a space investment firm. Sadia Pikanen, a University of Washington professor and the founding co-director of Space Policy and Research Center. She specializes in the commercial, legal, and security policy shaping outer space affairs. David Peterson, a veteran aerospace engineer and first employee at Teledesk. The satellite broadband effects are taking shape right before our eyes. In fact, stargazers will start seeing more low Earth orbit satellites in the coming years buzzing across the night sky, something that's already upsetting amateur and professional astronomers. SpaceX Starlink already operates more than 1,300 low orbit satellites, with thousands more in the pipeline. Meanwhile, guidelines this week released by the FCC are designed to make sure satellite collisions and subsequent space debris are minimized. On the early technical challenges of satellite broadband, it's sort of like playing three-dimensional whack-a-mole. You'd come up with all of the problems to solve and each one we'd solve. Another one would prop up, something replace it, David Peterson said. The wild, wild universe of space regulations. This whole idea of space traffic management where we have clear rules of the road about responsible behavior, not just by governments, but also corporations and spaces, I think, extremely important. And you're asking me if the structure has gone into place. No, it has not. Right now, we are at the stage where technology is sort of going into place. But law and policy and regulation do need to catch up and make sure that things remain stable and peaceful in space, said Sadi Pekin. On the next frontier of space innovation, what gets me the most excited is that we're going to be to the point where we can start to build new businesses on top of space infrastructure that is developed by others. So having global broadband will bring economic development to many areas of the world and raise economies and opportunities like remote education and telehealth as just to name a few. And I believe there is going to be more and more opportunities in areas like earth science, time and location services, and then applications of IoT, the internet of things. So what did we see this week? 
More of the same, continued wins by Elon, Starlink, and the whole SpaceX crew. We see a continued relationship with the United States government and a new one with Google providing a never before seen connection from satellite to secure data center. Sure, we have new competition coming from the Chinese, but really they're just gonna cause havoc up there and create more space junk in my opinion. Elon and the crew are just so far ahead of everyone in terms of technology, launches, and those ever so important contracts that keep a company going. As always, I'm excited Excited to see where this all goes and with 500,000 pre-orders already waiting and lusting after Dishy McDisherton, well, it's probably going to be a pretty successful business. I'm Hill Phantom, here with you, camping in my RV. Till next time, let's go.